We are back and we are joined now by Sam Russick, reporter researcher for The New Republic, whose piece is called Houston's Mayoral Race is Exposing the Left's Fault Lines. It's really fascinating. Uh, Sam, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, happy to be here. So um, this was a really interesting piece because it pits a more conservative kind of democratic coalition versus a more liberal at least nominally kind of democrat and, and, and in many ways uh democratic uh incumbent who's i believe being term limited out but that kind of still um coalition as well and the and unions within uh within texas and within houston and they're kind of more al- aligned with the conservative front runner here which is something that you wouldn't expect from the outside but your piece does a great job of of kind of fleshing it, fleshing it out um so but let's just i guess start from the beginning about who the players are here for our audience um the current mayor of houston and the conservative democrat who is the front runner to uh to to become the mayor after him who are these guys Okay, so I think it's helpful to start first with uh, John Whitmire. Uh, He has been in uh, the state legislature since around uh, 1972. Uh, He actually won his first election when he was in college still. Um, And he stayed in the sort of state, uh, you know, as a representative for around a decade before making the jump to the Senate, um, where he has stayed uh, since 82. So, you know, going on 40 years now. He's the dean of the Senate. he uh, sort of ran as a more, uh, I believe, progressive uh, candidate uh, at the time, uh, way back when. Um, but uh, he was a very ineffective uh, legislator. Uh, you know, uh, Texas Monthly actually, uh, when he sort of came around the curve in the 90s, uh, said that, you know, before then he'd just kind of been a class clown. Um, and uh, it wasn't until 1993 when he rewrote, uh, pretty much completely overhauled the uh, the penal code, uh, the prison system, essentially, uh, when he really became uh, sort of a household name, and the, like the dean of the Senate, um, which is in itself a kind of interesting way of thinking about the trajectory of the Texas Democratic Party. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't know this, but... Uh, Theodore Roosevelt had, you know, a four to one, uh, you know, support among people of Texas um, in uh, a couple of his runs. Uh, There was very strong support for him in the party, uh, a lot of union support, um, and there was a lot of union activity in Texas. Um, But that sort of gave way after the 60s uh, and the sort of rise of, you know, I'm sure your viewers are uh, you know, uh, aware of uh, neoliberalism and, you know, the sort of austerity politics that took hold around then. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Democrats held the majority in Texas from the Civil War basically all the way up uh, to the 90s, um, which is a very long time, but it led to a crisis in the party because they didn't really know where to turn after the New Deal era kind of uh, collapsed in on itself. Uh, so, uh, Whitmire and other Democrats sort of staked their claim on uh, along similar lines as Bill Clinton uh, as sort of tough on crime, uh, you know, uh, punitive politicians. Um, and, and that's exactly what Whitmire did. Uh, when he rewrote the penal code uh, in 1993, uh, you can look at it, uh, the Prison Policy Institute. Uh, there's like a graph from the 80s up into, you know, the where we are now uh in 1993 it's almost a straight line um (laughs) the uh the prison population more than doubled uh in just five years wow um and uh he did that by making more uh you know uh making sure that violent criminals uh had to serve at least 50 percent of their sentence before they were eligible for any kind of parole and uh totally removed good behavior from nonviolent offender crimes. So, you know, if you're in prison and you were caught with, you know, weed or something like that, uh, you could be held in prison for, you know, however long, uh, no matter how good you were in prison, you know, no matter, you know, what was going on there. Um, but, uh, you know, that didn't really work. Uh, the sort of rightward tack that the party took uh, still led to the rise of the Republican Party. Um, 
But because of his sort of tough on crime credentials, he has sort of maintained his status. Um, I'll get back to sort of the rest of that story, how he's uh, pivoted uh, later. But uh, Mayor Turner uh, was also uh, in the state uh, legislature for a long time uh, before he sort of came back to uh, Houston and ran for the mayoral spot. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, you can look back uh, at a lot of the coverage then and see that, you know, he was sort of uh, uh, marketed as this working, you know, he was originally working class. He was from the Acre Homes neighborhood, which is like a poor sort of black part of town. Um, and uh, uh, they marketed him as a working class progressive, uh, which when you hear that, you know, you think, you know, maybe, maybe he would be able to sort of implement some good stuff. Um, and, you know, his record has shown, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, kind of the opposite of that. He has sort of maintained uh, the status quo, uh, the sort of new Democrat line after Bill Clinton, say. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of progressives were disappointed with him. Um, he sort of lagged on uh, workers' protections. Um, he did, uh, he repeatedly, you know, delayed these affordable housing projects. He actually got sued by uh, Obama's housing and urban development uh which is sure. interesting because they, uh, uh, Houston, I believe, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but mm -hmm. had received uh, HUD grants to implement that um, Housing First policy that was quite successful for its 10-year run from 2011 to 2021. Right. Uh, that policy is still going. And I actually have another article about that that I wrote a while back. Um, it, it's a successful policy, to be sure. It gets a lot of people housed. Um, what, what I found uh, through sort of my research is uh, the problem with housing in Texas just generally is that there are very few tenant protections. So in Houston, where it's relatively affordable to live, um, you can uh, sort of, what they do is, you know, they partner with landlords and they're like, hey, you know, uh, if we pay, you know, so-and-so amount of the rent, like, will you take these uh you know, homeless people in. And they do that like all across the city, primarily in poorer part of town, parts of town. But, uh, you know, what, what ends up happening is uh, sometimes those landlords are not the best. Uh, mm. And, you know, they get moved into pretty, you know, can I, can I swear on the show or? Yeah, um, you know, go pretty, for it. Yeah, pretty, pretty shitty housing. Uh, I, I talked to this woman who, you know, she moved into this place and there were just rats all over the place. And uh, I, there was another woman who was in a car wreck before she became homeless and they put her on a second story apartment. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a mixed bag, but it has been overall successful, I would say. Um, but yeah, uh, he, he has gotten support for housing first policies and stuff like that. But at the same time, you know, when COVID came around, uh, while other cities like Austin and Dallas were sort of initiating their own eviction moratorium, because in a state like Texas, judges just decided to avoid or, you know, uh, ignore the CDCs, um, he decided not to. Like, he just waited to see what the state would do, hoping that the state would come in with a, a moratorium. And if you know anything yeah, about sure. Greg Abbott, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So before he did anything, more than 15,000 people were evicted. Uh, I, I talked to a woman at the time who, you know, she was at work, uh, at, I, I don't remember where she was working, but she went to the hospital with COVID and, you know, had the you know, tube on and everything. And when she came back home, you know, she's, she's walking home from the hospital finally, and there's an eviction notice on her door. And, and it was just stuff like that over and over again. So uh, that, that felt like a failure to a lot of progressives. Uh, it, you'll notice that like a lot of the unions that endorsed him in 2015, when he initially ran, uh, did not endorse him um, in 2019, because it, it felt like a betrayal. Yeah. Um, yeah, go yeah, on. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm, no, it's OK. I mean, and, and that, I guess, brings uh, us to kind of where we're at now, which was uh, a big focus of your piece. The fact that the m the very conservative, tough on crime uh, Democrat Whitmire that you highlighted, who's in his 70s, he's been in the in state government since he was in college and the uh, outgoing mayor uh, Turner are on like very different sides of 
this uh, dispute essentially over arbitration between firefighters and the city and the AFL-CIO has endorsed the more conservative Democrat here, Whitmire, in a fairly crowded field. So this is just a unique kind of coalition fracture that you don't necessarily see. I'm, I'm wondering if you could expand on it. Yeah, so uh, Whitmire, he got the endorsement of the AFL-CIO, uh, but he also has the endorsement of a bunch of you know Republican mega donors. Uh, Tillman Fertitta, actually the owner of the Houston Rockets, uh, sort of held the event where he announced his campaign and the AFL-CIO was there. He's gotten money from the Teamsters, uh, but, you know, also, you know, uh, Mattress Mac, who's this kind of uh, local character, uh, sells mattresses, but he's also very uh, much, uh, you know, a Trump supporter. Uh, yeah. Uh, and what, what's interesting about it is the fact that Whitmire was sort of able to outflank uh, Turner as a sort of progressive candidate uh, on this issue in particular. Uh, to talk a little bit more about the firefighter union uh, and the sort of uh, issue that was going on there. Um, basically, in 2003, voters, uh, the Houston voters, through a proposition, uh, agreed to allow uh, the Houston firefighters to negotiate, uh, finally, you know, um, their union and they didn't have even the right to negotiate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and they still don't have the right to strike. Uh, public employees in Texas don't have that. You have that in other areas. But I mean, just just to give you a sense of what, right, they're, right. what they have to work with here. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a long and sort of protracted struggle that they are going through. Um, I, when my source joined the uh, firefighters in 2016, uh, the average wage for cadets was uh, around twenty eight, twenty nine thousand dollars a year, which coincidentally, if you just you know fast forward to where we are now, uh, Houston is starting their own sort of uh, universal basic income uh, pilot program, and that's the cutoff. Uh, if you make twenty nine thousand dollars a year, if you're a firefighter at this point in time, you qualified for uh, people who are two hundred percent below the poverty line, um, and. You know, so in around 2017, they go to the mayor and they demand uh, increased wage, uh, as unions do. Um, but that, uh, as I understand it, uh, there were sort of two factors there. Uh, there's one that has to do with like budgeting, you know, the same sort of stuff you hear from a CEO, like we don't have the money for it. Um, and there's another thread where uh, a lot of people I talked to are like, you know, um, the uh, firefighters union, they can be a little bit abrasive um, when they when it comes to their demands. Um, and uh, Mayor Turner, uh, you know, uh, the quote I have in the piece is he's a little thin skinned. You know, uh, he, he uh, took it personally when they made such strong demands uh, to him. Um, and so he just kind of refused to negotiate. Um, as a lot of, you know, similar to, you know, star, the former Starbucks CEO, he kind of like made his own concessions on his own and was like, you know, over the course of so and so years, like you're going to get, you know, 6% raises every other, you know, year. Um, and uh, so where we are today, uh, the firefighters had it got an 18% raise total. But uh, that wasn't really what they were asking for. Like, it's still on the mayor's terms, which is a problem when it comes to collective bargaining and things like that. So that's where the firefighters sort of, uh, that's where that came in. Uh, Whitmire's bill, uh, what he was trying to do is mandate that the mayor must negotiate with the, uh, with the union. Uh, that's, that's the mandatory arbitration bit. Basically, like, you know, uh, there is a representative from the union camp, a representative from the city camp, and a neutral party, and they have to come to a deal. That's the bill. Um, and uh, sort of surprisingly, when that happened, a lot of liberals were upset. They were like, Whitmire is already messing with the budget. Um, he is, you know, 
enacting decrees in, in similar ways that Republicans have that have affected our elections, that have taken control of our school board, uh, that have you know done all these other things. It, it kind of grouped in with him because he's a conservative Democrat. But what the bill does is actually fairly progressive. Um, so there's this weird push and pull um, that, that uh, makes the race a little bit more complicated. Yeah, and, and we'll just uh, kind of wrapping wrapping things up here. I mean, that's what's interesting is the fact that the left in Houston and in Texas, maybe more broadly, uh, although it's a huge state, so I can't make wide generalizations. But what you highlight is that the liberal coalition like does not seem to be married in the way that other cities, other more like progressive municipalities are to labor and this fracture is being exploited by a more conservative democrat who is on their side i mean i think it's also notable that he is white whitmire uh versus the the current mayor who is black um and the firefighters uh, y- you quote in your piece that they're stereotypically associated with being trump supporters and that is not necessarily making um the best case for broader leftist rep- uh, leadership within Houston. Right. Yeah. I, I think um, uh, my, my source, the rank and file firefighter, uh, he sort of said it best when he said that, you know, the fact that there isn't a left candidate who really lobbied for union support and could also lobby to, you know, the different interest groups that make up the progressive coalition is a failure on the, uh, Houston uh, left's part, um, you know, I, I think it comes down to a lot of different things. Like uh, the uh, liberals in uh, Houston will tell you that it's mainly a budgeting issue. Uh, there was a sort of regressive austerity tax placed on property taxes, uh, which makes it uh, very hard for the city to sort of raise money in order to, you know, keep parks and roads paid and you know clean and uh if they give so and so amount of money to the firefighters then that sort of messes everything up in the budget and you know parks will go you know untended to and and things like that um but i I think uh what my source my firefighter source was sort of telling me is like we need to sort of expand the scope of, of what our government is capable of doing and you know, giving unions more power uh, in order to negotiate with the mayor and uh, helping to build labor power in the city will help us repeal things like that austerity tax and help us to uh, get funding for more things and, uh, you know, tax people more equitably and things like that. As opposed to pitting people against each other, which is, you know, uh, that's that's what conservative politics really sometimes boils down to. Sam Rusick, uh, the piece in The New Republic is entitled Houston's mayoral race is exposing the left's fault lines. We'll be monitoring this race for sure um, in the lead up to it. Really appreciate your time today, Sam. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much.